election year with we have three nationally renowned illustrators Victor who has frequently who frequently appears in Time magazine Esquire and Rolling Stone where he's known for his politically charged illustrations that accompany articles by Matt Taibbi and that's actually where I first got hooked on on Victor's work um, in college uh, reading Matt Taibbi and I was like who is this what who draws these incredibly engaging illustrations um, and then we have a uh, Tom Fluharty, he has provided cover art for publications around the world uh, uh, and in America for, uh, for publications such as Mad Magazine, Time, and The Weekly Standard. Um, he has a beautiful painterly style. Um, you know, I'm hoping you guys will all be as inspired as I am by these guys. Uh, the discussion will be moderated by Steve Broadner, who needs no introduction to our group because he's kind of one of our own at this point, but um, you know, his work appears regularly in, in uh, GQ, The Nation, Newsweek, The Washington Post, and many others. Uh, so let's give them a big round of applause welcome, and Steve can take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. I uh, want to thank him and everybody involved in putting the AAEC conference together. Uh, it's a, an extraordinary group, and uh, I'm very proud to be considered to be part of it, uh, even though um, I'm traditionally more on their side of the uh, world of, of graphic commentary as, a, as an illustrator. Um, and uh, I guess uh, we can just touch briefly on what the difference might be between being a cartoonist and being an illustrator. Um, I think uh, one of the major differences is that uh, if you're an illustrator, you are permanently unemployed. Uh, <laughs> cartoonists do have a, an idea that they might get a job someplace, and some of you actually are employed, which uh, is, is a, a very foreign concept to me, uh, but, but one that I envy. Um, and, um, but the, the luxury of, of, of being that insecure means that you are um, doing uh, highly uh, charged work uh, filled with tension, fear, and dread, uh, which produces sometimes uh, a, a high level of, of work and maybe a short lifespan uh, as well. Uh, but the deadlines are longer for an illustrator. Uh, you are inspired by uh, some of the great illustrators in the world, which uh, includes uh, great painters um, and people who are not just telling stories with pictures, but also in galleries. So there is that kind of mushy blending crossover thing that happens. Um, but there are a few illustrators who uh, have and are devoting their lives to uh, adding to the political conversation that we're having as a nation and as a world. Uh, there are some people who have found it to be uh, a possibility um, to occupy that space. Uh, and that's a good thing. I, it, to me, as a, as a failed political cartoonist in the very beginning, I started as a, a daily guy in a newspaper, uh, to realize that I could come back to New York, set up a studio in the village, and start to look for places to get work as a freelancer doing a kind of version of what I was doing on a newspaper uh, with a longer deadline. Um, that combined with a certain development of salesmanship, which is what we sort of need to, to be, uh, a, a person who can market his or her work. Uh, it's is this a, long ago or? This is, this is the, for 40, the last 45 years. <laughs> And uh, so it's a 45-year experiment for me, and uh, I'm, I'm still seeing if it's going to work out. Um, I, uh, I met Victor. Um, it, it doesn't seem so long ago, but it was uh, at the New York Times, something like 1977. You know, uh, I had hair then. Uh, Victor looked exactly like this. Tom, I met a whole bunch of years ago, uh, and have admired his work tremendously. So what we're going to do is uh, un unload our work on you, flip through our pieces, and uh, let you see what uh, the illustrators are doing uh, with respect to this political election year. Um, I would love there to be some questions uh, that we talk about finally, uh, that maybe the art inspires. Uh, for me, a very big question, if somebody wants to bring this up and, and discuss it. Uh, could be uh, how this particular election is different 
uh, than all other elect. That sounds very Jewish, doesn't it? Uh, but there is, there, is, there is something different about this election. And I do think it has something to do with the fact that uh, the more you throw at uh, a certain candidate, um, the, uh, the more we notice the opposite effect uh, takes hold. Uh, and in my experience, that never used to be the case. Um, so I'd love to be able to get into nuts and bolts. We have an hour and a quarter. Um, and we have too many slides, so let's begin. Uh, do you want to lower the lights a little bit? Uh, and, uh, and then start, I guess I'll start yeah. with, uh, with these pieces of mine. And Tom, we need your code. Everybody look at Tom's code so you can <laughs> uh, make sure you uh, can break into his system. Is that your code? Don't be, be careful, you'll catch a code. The code is uh, David Apatow. <laughs> All right. So Let's by doing it. this, there we, go. we will see a picture. No, we don't. Go down on the toolbar. This here? That's mine, I think. Yes, that's, that's yours. All right, so mine is here. There we go. All right, now we go to slideshow and play from the start. All right, uh, so here is... A, uh, do you think we could lower these lights a little bit? I'm sorry to be a stickler about this. Thank you. Uh, a sh a sh I'm a being a stickler. Um, so this is what I thought the election was going to come down to, and this was a cover for Newsweek uh, a long time ago, about a year and a half ago. Uh, it's hard to believe that Jeb Bush was ever a thing. Uh, but this was a, a Game of Thrones. Uh, it's us doing what, what we all do, which is to find things that don't necessarily belong together and then squeezing them and squishing them together and making it work. Um, Newsweek came back as, a, as an actual publication, which is wonderful. Uh, here's another one of our failed candidates. This was for uh, the nation. Uh, Ted Cruz with uh, his forebears and good friends. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I didn't believe he would go as far as he did, but he did pretty well. Uh, and here's the king of New Jersey uh, <laughs> for the nation, uh, Chris Christie. It's interesting who all these people who had a kind of a, an expectation of things happening for them. Uh, the they minute had they it of themselves, uh, for them. Right. But you know, I mean, these at one point these people felt viable, right? Uh, but. Touched by Donald Trump, these people are ruined for life. We're, we're never going to hear from them again. Um, although this guy thinks we're going to hear from him again. There's uh, Scott Walker for the nation. Um, the, uh, the two versions of Scott Walker. Um, he, uh, I had a, 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 what I thought was a better idea for the cover. And they said, OK, you can do that for the inside. Uh, and it was this. It was a kind of a double caricature <clears throat> of Scott as Nixon. Um, and this, uh, I thought, was going to be really easy. And I was up till 4 in the morning with this, because it's either one or the other. Can you get both? And the answer is almost always no. It's not working. Um, but it did finally work. And uh, another cover of Newsweek, and it's, it's the choir uh, about religion and politics. Um, and uh, a Hillary. So I work for, I'm kind of this vagabond, itinerant guy. Um, and here's Newsweek. And here's Hollywood Reporter. This is where I'm kind of like you guys in a way. I'll call a magazine. I'll say, all right, let's do a package of things. Uh, let's uh, um, think about um, how uh, we can make a grouping. So it's like a tree, and I make all these little ornaments for the tree, and I send the magazine, I send the art director maybe seven or eight ideas. I say, pick your top five. Um, and so that's how these things get, get born. So when things get a little slow, I'm really writing and pitching. And I usually have two, three pitches uh, out there in the ether at all times. And I start with the best paying magazines, and then I, as I get rejected, I go down to the next rung and the next <laughs> rung. Hollywood Reporter pays pretty well. I bring this up to show you that this was the summer movies, and Ted 2 and Jurassic World has got Hillary and Jeb, and uh, Mission Impossible is Huckabee hanging from a wire. Uh, but then when you get to the Fantastic Four, uh, you'll see that George Pataki is the thing. 
Now, who ever paid any attention, George Pataki running for president, but while this was happening, Trump starts to happen. And there is no Trump in here at all. So after I did the finish, I called the art director and I said, we got, I got to put Trump in there. So I replaced the head. Um, and that's my first, that was my first Trump of the season. This is actually my very first Trump ever. It's from Spy Magazine in 1988. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, uh, a, uh, a very uh, early one, but I kind of have the same, the same idea of how to draw him. Uh, I'll go th a little faster through these. Uh, Huckabee for Politico, uh, horning in on uh, Matt uh, Worker's action a little bit, uh, and uh, with his permission, of course. Uh, and uh, so I wanted Huckabee taking a picture of himself with a selfie stick. But then the article, I realized, is about his evangelical background. And I said, well, make it a, make it a cross. Um, here's a series on immigration for the nation. Uh, Jeb Bush uh, leading the Crusades. Uh, Chris Christie worrying about babies coming over the George Washington Bridge. Always got to put a bridge in there for Chris. Uh, Ted Cruz giving the Muslim woman the lie detector test. Um, here's a, a piece for Politico, I believe, of uh, Huckabee riding uh, Kim Davis. Remember her? Um, and uh, <laughs> giddy app. And, uh, uh, Ted Cruz uh, for the Boston Globe, um, a part of another package. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. Uh, it gets tiresome, but here he is planting the flag in the Congress by tying things up, and some unfortunate congressman's about to get it between the eyes. Um, people found out about... That's one good thing about what happened this year. People found out about Ted Cruz, who he is, you know, what kind of a human being he is. <laughs> Became pretty clear, even to Republicans. Um, channeling Ralph Steadman. Uh, Donald Trump uh, imagining uh, the uh, applauding Muslims at the time of 9-11. He must have been strung out on something, some acid, something like Hunter Thompson. Uh, part of an LA Times package, uh, a deeply personal affair. Uh, too complicated to explain. It's in the exhibit. It's in the exhibit, okay, thank you. Um, did you explain it in the exhibit? Yes. Well, I'm glad, you can tell me later. Uh, Here's Bill as a ball and chain uh, on Hillary's ankle. Um, and uh, just before uh, uh, Donald Trump went on Saturday Night Live, uh, which was a pretty unspectacular performance, I did a series of Trump uh, as Saturday Night Live characters for Hollywood Reporter. This is Stefan. Here's Wayne's World. And of course, as a conehead. Um, for GQ, I did a series of favorite quotes. So uh, one of his early victims was Charles Krauthammer. I never thought I would make Charles Krauthammer <laughs> to be a sympathetic character, but he is in a wheelchair. And Trump made fun of the fact that, uh, why should I be taking uh, insults from a man who can't buy a pair of pants? Uh, which is really, what a wow. sweet guy. You should know right away. Tells you right off the bat. Uh, this was a cover of Time Magazine that became an inside piece. Uh, Trump uh, providing his own hot air. And it is in here, after all. Uh, my comment for the nation on uh, what's it's underneath right. the comb over. Right. It's really underneath the comb over. Um, right, you, uh, not the cover, it didn't make the cover. Sure uh, well, thanks, but uh, I'm glad they ran it, a period. Uh, this is from the, na the, the Village Voice. Uh, Vic and I have both been working uh, with Andrew Horton at The Voice because they have been purchased by, luckily, a, a financier who loves caricature. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are greatly encouraged to do things like this. This is Trump as the toy fascist. This is an idea I pitched the Boston Globe, the, 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 the cabinet that uh, Trump would have. Uh, so uh, Sarah Palin as Secretary of Education, and Bobby Knight as Secretary of Defense, and uh, Hulk Hogan was supposed to be his vice president. I don't know what happened to that. Uh, I did one for Hillary also. Kim Kardashian, the Secretary of Education. Amy Schumer, Beyonce, Rosie O'Donnell, Snoop Dogg, Lena Dunham, and Warren Buffett. Um, I have fun. Uh, <laughs> Hillary uh, finds that some women are not entirely uh, supporting her. This is for Boston Globe. Uh, here's kind of an even-handed illustration for the New York Times. 
It is the New York Times, and it was an illustration project. Um, but my rationale was to show how both candidates saw themselves in media, and that's what uh, the, the writer is writing about. Um, in this one, uh, I had, uh, so on the left side, flowers are coming out of the lenses for Mr. Trump, who was very pleased with himself. But on the right-hand side, I had guns coming out of the, out of the uh, lenses for Hillary, because that's, you know, a, a paranoid person thinks that way. Uh, but uh, they made me change it to wagging fingers which is absolutely cheesy, but that's, it's the New York Times, come on, uh, great lady. Um, Village Voice uh, asked me to go down to Cleveland to cover the Republican convention, and I said, you know, I'd like to instead cover it from TV, because I did that four years ago for The Nation. Um, and I sat in my studio with the TV going, and I had an assistant behind me, and I would just sketch in the sketchbook every 15, 10, 15 minutes, do a picture, tear it off, give it to my assistant. He would color it and then send it out to their thing and they'd go on Twitter and Facebook. And I did 150 illustrations in the course of the two weeks. And uh, uh, some of them are actually worth showing. Uh, <laughs> not entirely proud of all of them. Uh, this is the way it started. Uh, I have more back here somewhere. But this is, uh, this is my first one, uh, Trump's hat, head being a, a helmet with a big finger on the top, Teutonic uh, outfit. Um, this was another Village Voice uh, cover I did, uh, uh, Jaws, uh, kind of an obvious idea, but uh, you know, you can have fun with simple things. Uh, this was for, uh, <laughs> this was for my, co my convention coverage, uh, kind of speaks for itself. Um, and, uh, also pre-convention. Mm. If you remember, uh, Trump was trying to get in with the Jews. So uh, the, uh, the rationale was to, to claim that he's always wearing a beaver hat. Um, and uh, uh, during the conventions, I was enjoying using a varsity fountain pen, you know those d disposable fountain pens? And just not taking any prep, just taking the fountain pen going and, and doing a 15, <laughs> a five minute drawing with it. And uh, as you can see, when it comes to Ivanka, I didn't care if it looked like her or not, as long as I made my, my statement. So here she is as the princess, uh, and it's an actual quote. I was trying to get the real quotes. He has the kindness and compassion to enable him to be the leader of, that this country needs. Uh, Giuliani always looks like this to me. <laughs> He's a screaming skull every time, and thinking like, die, Dracula, die. And Sarah Silverman said this, and I just quoted her, and uh, I don't know, just some people are just fun to draw. Um, and here's a full page for the LA Times of just a couple of weeks ago, uh, where it's, the order has been a little shifted around here, but um, I have, uh, I gave them uh, eight ideas, um, and they took all of them. They, I said, boil it down to five, and they said, we're going to take all eight, and, uh, and like an idiot, I said, okay. So I, I worked really hard over a short period of time, um, and uh, so um, Hillary Clinton's debating partner in preparation for the debate is Sean Hannity in drag, and uh, Trump's, uh, or rather, that's Trump's partner, and Hillary's would be Chewbacca. Uh, more from the convention, uh, Paul Ryan in uh, Trump's pocket, uh, number 2B pencil on Canson's sketchbook paper with Photoshop. Here's a, a scene of Hillary actually in Benghazi. We don't really, never seen this one before, but she was there with a rocket uh, propelled grenade. Uh, here's Trump Jr. Um, a, w in leopard skin uh, saying uh, the business I was taught by my father uh, is uh, to make the tough decisions, and he certainly does, especially when it comes to Skittles. Uh, and uh, last, and maybe least, is uh, this uh, piece that ran in the nation, um, a, uh, a real cartoon <laughs> that I came up with and, uh, and sent to them uh, uh, that, um, that I think embodied the idea of Trump's statement of how he could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and and still get a lot of support. So I drew him uh, firing at the Khan family. Mr. Khan produces his constitution 
it ricochets and hits Trump in the gut. And yes, people are cheering. They're having, they're approving heartily of it. Okay, so that's mine, and uh, now on to Tom. Thank you. You know, you know, just escape it? Yeah? Okay. Excuse me. Adam, the same You're down below, here, right? Sorry. <laughs> Yay, Adam. It's always good to have somebody knows what they're doing. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Well, this was, uh, I had drawn uh, Bush for Der Spiegel uh, back in, I don't even know what year it was. And um, it, was too, it was too crazy. And I, I, he was like a, a sheriff on, on, on the globe going, <laughs> shooting his gun. And he was just crazy looking. And then after I handed the cover in, they said, Tom, that cover is way too crazy. We had to give it to somebody in-house. So my first opportunity to do the cover of Der Spiegel was hijacked, and I hijacked it myself pretty much. And then so after that, I, I, he just basically said, if you don't go so crazy, we have a conservative readership. Don't go so crazy, you'll get more work. So at that point, I had been really thinking a lot about portrait of caricature. So I just did this on my own sort of uh, poking fun at uh, George and his uh, cowboyness. So. And that's, that was in acrylics. And this was for the Weekly Standard. Um, this was in oils when I painted in oils on deadline, which is not advisable. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what I was thinking, but uh, the call came in was like, could you do Hillary and Bill as, uh, as a soap opera? And so at those points, you cancel main events to do that. So I canceled my wife's birthday party. No, I'm kidding. Um, did, you, did you scan it? How did you? Yeah, it I actually paint? scanned it. Well, yeah, you, it, it, you're, you're painting with medium so, uh, medium so that it dries. Okay. And yeah, it was, like I said, it's not advisable. But uh, anyways, that was too much. I just, I just Googled um, soap opera, and the, the image that came up was just crazy, you know, dramatic moment. And then uh, I have a love affection, a love affair with Hillary, unfortunately. I love to draw Hillary. She just, I don't even know what it is, but uh, I, I never get tired of drawing, drawing Hillary. And so this was just a study that I did that'll show up in another image. And then this was for the Weekly Standard as well uh, with her. They, they actually ran this along the bottom of the page and all, all across the page she was dri dri dripping documents. And um, so that's actually digital. So you could do that in a day. It might be a day that it takes you. So it's a lot faster. And this was uh, a painting I did back in, in, in uh, acrylics back in the day uh, when Hillary was getting ready to run in, what year was it, 2004 maybe? And, uh, oh, wait, oh, wait. So I kept seeing this image in my head and I couldn't kind of shake it. And um, the, the, the title was Sir Hillary Poised for a Takeover. And so I just uh, heavily relied on one of my favorite painters and, um, and, sent, and you know, did this. Uh, it was just a promotional piece. Favorite painter was? What's that? Favorite painter? Oh, uh, Jean-Auguste uh, Dominique Hang. Um. Um, he's a French painter. But yeah, so anyways, this was actually, I submitted this into a, a, a Spectrum Fantastical um, art competition and it actually won a gold medal, which I was completely shocked. That's not a brag, I'm just simply saying, there's a story here. They actually split the whole panel because people were really upset at this piece because they didn't think it was, um, uh, uh, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Political, correct? It, it was political and, and it was, that's more of a fantastical space, Star Wars kind of a competition, but they let it in, so it was pretty crazy. And then this was just something I did digitally <laughs> before one of the debates. Uh, I think this is before Hillary and, uh, and, and Bernie's debate. So that's digital as well. And then this was a study for Bill for uh, uh, another image. This is, yeah. So I'll use this in another image, but I, I basically do studies like this before I take it. This is an image that's uh, sort of what if. So I'm going to 
actually paint this. Uh, this is in the in the in the uh, uh, the, the vein of uh, Jackio and uh, and and uh, Kennedy, and so I'm going to paint this on November 3rd. And if she makes it in, it'll run. If she doesn't make it in, it'll run either way. So it'll have a little visual commentary too. Weekly tip. standard? No, for me, just just for, for me. yourself. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm basically getting ready for the election. And then this is a cover for the Weekly Standard. What if? Our worst case scenarios, I think it was. And so uh, I had this idea. Uh, I had a few options for Trump's face. <laughs> and it seems like the more I draw Trump, his hair just gets more crazy. But um, anyways. Uh, I had another face of Trump's, but this one was more pomp, pomp, pompous and more So I just thought it was really the Technical right term. face to choose, you know. And, uh, and this was just an oil <laughs> painting of uh, Hillary that I did in my free time. You can see in my free time, it's sort of consumed with Hillary, which is, I think I need help. <laughs> uh, here's a Trump. Uh, this was a study for uh, um, 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 another image. This was, and that's the actual image. So this is the actual painting, and that's digital. And that, that's usually about a day's worth of work that I have. They, they run these little spots, and I just paint them digitally. And then this was a recent cover that was <laughs> changed in the middle of the day. So I, I was drawing Putin moving these guys around on a chessboard. <laughs> and uh, they called me, and I had worked all night on it, Wednesday night. Tuesday night, basically, and then uh, it's due Thursday. And so basically, they called me on Wednesday at in the afternoon, three in the afternoon, and said, okay, great, we've got your sketch. We want to pay you 500 extra dollars. And I was like, amazing, sweet, awesome. And he goes, we're changing the idea. And I was like, what are you talking about? And now they said, you know, now it's supposed to be a three ring circus, which nothing is, no one's inventing the wheel here. There's always a race, a horse race. It's three ring circus, it, you know, anytime you get this. It's, so we have to make it different, and make sure you have never seen this before, but we're not inventing the wheel. But I, I just, again, this is great material to work with these guys, you know, both Trump and Hillary. So then uh, Putin was thrown in there as well. Uh, sorry, did I go the wrong way? Okay, and then this was, uh, this was again the weekly standard, and this was one of those calls where it's like, um, you know, Wednesday night I'm you know, hanging with my family, or Tuesday, and I'm hanging with my family, and all of a sudden I get a call, you want to do Trump as King Kong, and I'm like, oh, absolutely. So I, see, I saw it immediately, and, um, and again, you, you have about, I had about a day and a half on this, maybe two days, but it's, because it's digital, you can sort of fly through do, it. Do they ever call you and say, uh, here's the article, uh, what are your ideas, or is it mostly that they do some of the concept work themselves? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, most of the time, the story is sent to me, but I don't, I don't really, um, I don't change the uh, editor's idea. Like, I'll, we've talked him down a little bit, but usually if the editor has something in his mind, I can't. Right. I know the editor, right. but I'm not going to, I'm not going to say, here's my take on it. We know those editors. Yeah, yeah, right? But they're good. I mean, I love these guys. They're good guys to He's me, good. but they, they don't, they don't give me too many, any problems. And then this was Trump, uh, Banana Republic, that is which was crazy. Oh, man. Um, totally. And then this was the sketch that I get. <laughs> so from that, they, I get that. And again, it's digital, so you can Just crank great. it out. This is uh, in, in relation. <laughs> in, <laughs> this was after Michael Phelps had won his uh, many trophies. Ugh. I started thinking of Trump. And then... <laughs> So you can see the, uh, the, the suction. Cu the cupping. Yeah, the cupping was cupping. happening down below the trouser line. And uh, I literally was laughing doing this. And so it seemed to be pretty well received. Uh, I, 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 I think you're, you've left something out toward the bottom. Oh, he's wearing Speedos. Right? Yeah, he does have Speedos on. So. And then this was just a study that I did um, just in between. I'll, I'll do warm up sketches in the morning. Uh, this was actually a crazy day cover that was off the charts. Like, you, sometimes you don't have time, but this was just, this was again a crazy deadline. And you have to have Trump blowing into this hot air that's sort of balloon that's, that's popped. And so I, I Google, after I find the face that I want, a few different faces of Trump, I, uh, I Googled Dizzy Gillespie playing the trumpet. And then um, I actually did a pose for it as well. That way you can 
sort of bring in those blowing, how exaggerated. Did, how did you deal with the cityscape in such so a short... The cityscape is an image I grabbed off of Getty, and then I throw a filter onto it, change it up, and then I paint slightly into it, and then I morph it and twist it. And then the sky is... The sky is again. It's a fo It's a. It's an image from Getty, so and I combine a, different things together, and then I paint a little bit over do, top do of them. You, do you do you put a filter that imitates oil paint? I don't do that. Um, but but they, you can, right? Yeah, but then then you're committing to that look of oil paint, and then it has texture to it. So I don't. That that's like. It's like all of a sudden I'm putting something in that doesn't match with everything else. So yeah. there are. What is the symbol on up. Ted Cruz's balloon? Is that Al Jazeera? What is that? <laughs> I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. I beg pardon? That's his campaign logo? Okay. Yeah, trust me. Doesn't it look like the Al Jazeera logo? <laughs> that explains everything. And then this was Obama for the Weekly Standard. Um, they just wanted him looking pompous. And um, so this was, <laughs> this was, uh, this was, this, and again, this is all digital, but it was crazy. And I think the sketch started there. Wonderful. And then, uh, so I do. I draw traditionally, and then I scan in, and then I paint over top. I of love it. the way you plot out your shadows, as if they're little uh, uh, characters. You know. Oh you, yeah. You give them uh, little uh, draw, boxed in uh, borders. Yeah. It's like this is this is how much shadow this gets. Right, right, right. That's yeah. so. That's so smart. Oh, thank you. And these are uh, various Obamas. Uh, again, you can, this one I cut and pasted, I drew on tracing paper back before Photoshop, and I would move noses and things like that. This was a digital, That's one of my true. first digital drawings of Obama, which um, I don't really try to draw digitally, I paint digitally, but you lose a lot. This is just another, um, this was uh, for the standard as well. Uh, just, this is, and then I draw the eyes in later, I make them look where I want them to. Uh, another just classic quick drawings, and these might take anywhere from like 15 minutes. And then I, I'm thinking of superheroes, <laughs> so I, I was going to Comic Con in San Diego, and I decided to create uh, some of these uh, superheroes. So there's Obama's Captain America. Great. And then uh, <laughs> Billy has a flash. The, the funny thing is, if you squint your eyes, you can actually see. That, that is. You can. And everybody squinting their eyes. That's pretty weird. So primo. It is yeah. there. It looks much better here, too. Yeah. It's a little muddy on the screen. Yeah, this is when I actually laughed at. Sometimes I laugh as I'm doing my... If you're laughing... That would be the pose. <laughs> That's me posing as Obama. And then there's Hillary as a superhero. The dog down below is freaking out. <laughs> and that's the picture I used, one of them for him. These are other studies of Obama's back of his head. Mm. Uh, another Obama face. And these are just a dog that I, I've been drawing dogs, so I think I can stop. There's another dog. <laughs> this one's called Sleep, Let Sleeping Dogs Lie. But we do, outside of the politics, we do this. And there's my other dog. I think yeah. that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And I never saw the dog before. Yeah. Sorry. Before I even start, um, I just want to say it's, it's quite a privilege to be here, and um, I have no envy for the responsibilities that you as editorial cartoonists um, have in terms of being brilliant every day. Um, I'm one of those people who comes up with uh, the best answer in an argument four hours later, or uh, in, in my own career, um, I'm not quick like Steve, so my best ideas are usually four days after the, it stopped, it stopped being newsworthy. Vic is very modest, and you have, we have to all forgive him for that. Way too modest. So... Uh, I, you, could you press slideshow oh, on the top? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see it. This is better. Please, let's Oh, we did it again. There it is. There you go. Yeah. It is only it? gets one. <laughs> okay. okay. So now, first step. Look at that. I, I posted this, uh, I'm putting this here because it's, it's a lesson in certainty. Uh, the Republican Party did not destroy. As a matter of fact, uh, it, um, it came on to provide 
approximately eight years of complete misery to Obama, but uh, it's, I'm, I'm always wary whenever there is a definitive statement on any particular political situation. This is the only one I'll post from uh, my early career uh, working for the New York Times back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And um, uh, po this is essentially one of my influences, which was Looney Tunes, uh, Tex Avery, Bob Clampett, and the expression on Reagan is sort of like when Tex would do that. One side of the head is turning this way, and the other side is still looking in the other direction. Uh, after, after illustrations like this happened, Abe Rosenthal called the uh, art director, John Kaye, into his office and said, um, he's drawing him like an ape. And John came back to me and said, Abe says you're drawing him like an ape. I said, he is an ape. <laughs> <laughs> I, I stopped working for the Times after, uh, yeah. not soon after that. <laughs> this is, uh, a lot of my work is, is, has been since the, uh, a lot of my favorite work has, uh, since the mid-2000s has been for Rolling Stone and uh, we really kind of uh, took off once the, the first campaign, uh, presidential campaign between o o Obama, for Obama happened and during that period of time uh, John McCain started finding religion and Matt Taibbi wrote a very very funny, as he usually does, uh, and, and biting uh, critique on, on uh, McCain's lack of real religious fervor. But I, it was probably my most anti-Semitic Jesus I've ever drawn. <laughs> sort of like an even-handed commentary, also for Rolling Stone. It was, uh, and it was one of my more um, straight-on exag exaggerations uh, the, the older I'm getting, the more I'm, I'm sticking closer to the script in terms of the faces. I, I tend to treat them more as psychological studies. So that uh, when, <laughs> back when, back when uh, Hillary had mentioned something about ISIS being like an existential crisis, and Matt, <laughs> Matt Taibbi goes, what is, she, what is she, like Satra or something? So, and then of course, this was during the, uh, the campaign that uh, uh, Hillary's first attempt uh, against uh, uh, Barack, and uh, that was pretty much the way I summed her up. I don't like, uh, unfortunately, I hate drawing Hillary, and for a purely uh, selfish, unpatriotic reason, I'd want to see Trump get elected because, for me, <laughs> for me, she's a total nightmare. Um, can you can you say why? Yeah, I, I have my reasons. I have my re oh, I, I, and we've kicked it around quite often. There is no Hillary there. Uh, she turns slightly. She becomes a completely different person. She also morphs. There's no sub substantive, sub substantive uh, person there. So that I feel like for me the difficulty in capturing her in a caricature is. Uh, is, is more a reflection of uh, a psychological reflection on her. But I, don't, you, uh, don't you think that it's possible that uh, 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 it's a cause for her struggles as a candidate? Absolutely. Is, she, that, is that it's striking other people the same way? It's like, who are you now? Which is, why, which is why she's so distrusted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This was for, that was for both of those, these, these drawings were for uh, another Matt Taibbi piece on just discussing that first debate where, uh, where it was Hillary as the sweaty Nixon oh, yeah. and, and Barack as, as, as the new, he was appointed, he was anointed by Ted Kennedy as like the new John Kennedy. But later on he just uh, kind of just got mashed in the, uh, the machinations of, of politics. And as opposed to the original uh, Charlie Chaplin image, I've got pieces falling all over the place. The, uh, this was something for GQ. And it was uh, called the debt ceiling. <laughs> and it was a, a, a five day, no, it was a three day, I'm sorry, three day, 24-7 uh, piece for, for GQ. We kicked it around. Uh, it was 
three-day deadline? A lot of, a lot of coffee, but um, it was an opportunity to not only uh, parody the Michelangelo, but uh, also just to get as many faces. The only person I forgot, the only person I forgot was Grover Norquist, who was such a, a factor, and nobody mentioned that during the discussions with the editor. By, by the way, uh, in my situation, I, I, when I work for like Rolling Stone, I'm, I'm very fortunate to work with people who get it, who really trust the, the, the artist uh, to pretty much manage the idea. Sometimes they'll, they'll tweak me, but uh, for the most part, uh, what, I th what I illustrate is pretty much what I'm, uh, my, my concept. Um, going into the cur the cur this current campaign, this is an old, uh, Brock, uh, now I think Rocky and Bullwinkle. Remember when Bullwinkle kept on, watch me pull a rabbit out of the hat, and he kept on pulling out something wrong, and in this situation it was the, uh, the GOP <laughs> continuing to pull out skunks. Also note, there's, uh, there's a very, uh, Trump uh, also doesn't factor. He's, I almost put him in as an afterthought in the illustration. This was how early on it was. But, um, right, he's not central at all. Still but Marco was, was, yeah. was, the, uh, was definitely another skunk, yeah. and who's soon to um, find himself in that, that Moses moment where uh, the, the audience was, was the, the, the electorate was going for the golden calf, who, by the way, is hung well in that picture. Do you, uh, do you find Rubio hard to draw? I do. I don't find Rubio. I think, it, no, Rubio for me was, was a joy because he was kind of like a little bit of Peter Lorre. He was a little, <laughs> bit, of, was a little bit of Edgar G. Robinson, a young Ed, Ed, Edgar G. Robinson. And if you really look closely, you didn't, you didn't even have to look that closely, but there are any number of pictures where you're looking at the eye activity and you're going, God, does, you know, if I was like uh, a police artist, I, I'd be drawing this this eye activity going on. They're just slightly off, just enough that there's either a serial killer uh, <laughs> element or, or, or a, uh, like Peter Lorre in M, you know? There's just that, that really <laughs> creepy factor to him. No clown cars. The, the, uh, the, uh, this was a piece by Matt, and by, uh, the one, this was one time where Rolling Stone said, well, we'd like a clown car p uh, image, you know? We think that could be funny. And I said, uh, have, you have you Googled this, this campaign so far? There's eight million Republicans coming out of, out of a cl clown car uh, image already. Uh, I don't want to do a clown car. So let's do them coming out of an elephant's asshole. <laughs> with, the biggest, with the biggest clown uh, being squeezed out like a hemorrhoid. <laughs> so, um, this was great, you know. It's marvelous. It, it was fun they went with taking faces yeah. and putting Crazy. paint on them, Crazy. white facing, and, and, uh, uh, and uh, Emmett Kelly and them, them out. But uh, it, just to say parenthetically, I, it's also one of the best Trumps, just yeah. in terms of caricature. Yeah, it's great. You but really it's very straight. If you really think about it, it's a very yeah, straight right. portrait. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes that's, As opposed that's to, the most you know, effective way to go is just to really just blend it. And the, the, the further the campaign went on, the more Trump's hair just kept on falling lower and lower mm -hmm. in yeah. front of his face, right. for me, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, how many of you ever read Dondi? Dondi had this friend, this kid who was a, who had, uh, another yeah, guy, yeah. and he had this blonde hair that always went over his eyes. Right. Uh, and uh, the more the campaign went on, the more I'd watch Trump, as little as possible, mm -hmm. uh, I'd say, well, he's, he's kind of got that butch thing going on. But here, the reference is obviously Bergman. I like to steal, um, I, like to, I like to reference classic uh, imagery, either from fine art, great cartoons, uh, old Popeyes and Bugs Bunnies and stuff like that, or great films. And this was a perfect opportunity to uh, parody the, uh, um, the Seventh Seal. At this point, Trump's hair is completely over yeah, his face. Awesome. And th th this was for the, um, the American Prospect. And there was a huge red background that I threw in the, uh, when it finally ran on the, on the cover of the, the issue. 
but I, I really enjoyed just focusing on the, the characters themselves and the fight going on, the, 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 the chaos. I liked, uh, and I, you know, in one sense, Kasich was very funny because there was, there was something very blockish about him and, and with those sad, mournful expression uh, all the time on his face. He, he made a transition from being a, a kind of a drone-like lieutenant for Gingrich to uh, doing a reasonable imitation of a human being. He, yes, I, and, and I could have actually conceived of him, you know, until he started talking to religion stuff, and it was like, oh, God. Anyway. Yeah, he, might have, he might have had a future in the Republican Party if it hadn't gone south. Well, if, right. Um, also, for Rolling Stone, it was basically a wrap-up of the Republican convention, <laughs> uh, really? re referencing Hieronymus Bosch, and uh, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, Ted hanging off the tree. Uh, it's Jesus uh, appearing, uh, coming out from limbo and just realizing he's probably better off going into limbo. Somebody dropped their, There's somebody their dropped. apparatus. Anyway, and, and, the, uh, and the traditional Republican, uh, the GOP elephant being fed to the fire. Again, referencing, <laughs> referencing one of my favorite movies, Dr. Strangelove, uh, and uh, there was actually more fun drawing that elephant from behind than, uh, and, and getting that gesture almost than, than, do, than doing Donald. Although it was that opportunity to do that. There, is the, there are those uh, famous pictures of him in a wind where his, that, that, uh, that hairdo gets blown over to the side. And I had to find, I found this one I didn't have the original in my, my laptop, so I, uh, uh, I did have somebody send this to me, and that was the most current issue of Rolling Stone, which was Matt's wrap-up of uh, uh, Trump. Originally, that poster in the background was solid, and uh, they said, you know, it's, it, it's competing with him. That's one time that Art Direction came in and was very handy, and uh, I pretty much thought I'd put it to bed. And uh, they said, you know, it's, it's, it's really competing with him. So I came back and I said, well, I'm really not good on Photoshop fixing things like that. So I did it uh, again. I'm, I'm bricks and mortar. I'm very analog. So I went in with a sponge and I just started uh, sc screwing with my, my illustration, just mm -hmm. rubbing it and, and uh, redrawing it. Warning. Great. It's genius. The problem with your wonderful. primary system. Jesus Christ. Close it. Anyway. Um, Bravo. You got it. So, um, you know, I, between these two guys, I, you're looking at um, a, a wide range of uh, ways of looking at, uh, at how to handle a microphone. And, and uh, everybody has their own unique style, you know, of uh, dropping mics. And, so that must mean he's a rapper, right? He's dropping the mic. Um, and, uh, but uh, Tom is uh, uh, a, uh, an amazing portrait artist who is looking for ways to in, kind of infuse point of view inside the face. Uh, Vic is doing that too, but he's, he's uh, uh, maybe um, a, uh, a kind of a classical caricaturist in the sense that he's looking for references all the time that um, are uh, hoping and expecting that we all uh, have these as a, a fund of a kind of a digital image library in our brains that will enable us to uh, to converse using metaphors. Well, we look for that tell. I think, in particular, I think you and I both we look for that tell in in, in the Google search. Yeah. Uh, of of uh, just that says something about the personality, you know. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, you could have fifteen pictures of Hillary and. Five of them don't look anything like yes, it. Yes, exactly. this is a well, very big problem. problem. Back to that problem. And, and sometimes, sometimes, or which Hillary? I yeah, mean, yeah. sometimes, you know, yeah. a, a Hillary from from the 2000 looks like her then. Yeah. 2004, 2005, mm -hmm. uh, j last July. You have to pick which era you want to draw. Right? Yeah. Which, Some, 
sometimes somebody new comes on the scene and uh, they're immediately in the limelight and I've never seen the person. So I have to Google that person. I, I, I've never heard of them, never seen them. And then I got to figure out, well, which picture looks like the guy. And that's really tricky. And you have hours to finish it. And it's, you, you have to somehow have a sense of you're picking the image that really captures that person because you've never seen them right. as well. Technology is, not, uh, technology is not necessarily made our job it's made it different, but it, this hasn't necessarily made it easier because uh, there's, there's, there's that element of, oh, you've got, you can just jump right on Google, so you can get this job done real fast, don't you think, you know? Um, I, I don't know, I, I, I kind of like to steer the, the discussion for a few minutes anyway uh, in the direction of where we all overlap. Well, what you do and what we do uh, uh, are shooting for some of the same things. And um, I don't know if, uh, if you guys want to join in, but I would really be grateful. Um, I, I know you're all shy, so it's like, like very hard for me to encourage you to speak out. Um, so, um, our microphone line over here, here. So people can walk up um, and ask but questions. My, my sense is that we're all doing this because we want to add to the national debate in some significant way. Um, we, uh, I don't think we're, any of us are under any delusion, at least any more, that we're going to save the world, although I think uh, there's always this Thomas Nast uh, syndrome that uh, I've talked about before, where uh, maybe in the beginning you look at people in the past who've been able to have dynamic, uh, 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 amazing, heroic uh, in impacts on the world with a single drawing. Uh, and then you get to the place where you say, well, um, you know, it's not really determined how we're going to influence things, but we're in the conversation, we're, we're in the game. And for me, uh, it comes really down to silence equals death, which is the old AIDS activists slogan. Um, and the choice for me is the, the choice between doing it or not doing it, saying something or, or, or remaining silent. Um, but um, I, uh, I'd be interested in hearing uh, uh, your perspective or your perspective on um, this year and, and if that's changed at all, the idea of what impact we're having, how we feel our role may have changed because of the changing media, uh, or anything else you feel like asking. Do you have any ideas about that? Like uh, I, I, uh, how your mission, your mission may have been changed or altered? Well, I think the mission has been changed from the standpoint of, I've come to really despise media per se. I was on a, uh, an LHD, which is, uh, a fancier way of saying an, a, a, a version of an aircraft carrier last week with the, the Marines and the Navy. And it was one of the first times uh, I've watched TV in a long time. Um, one of our sons insisted that we get a smart TV about two years ago, and it turned out to be too smart for me, so I, I stopped watching television because I needed three controls in order to, to find what I wanted. So I said, F it, I, I don't need it, I don't need it. So uh, watching on the, in the mess hall the various television sets, uh, Fox was on, CNN was on, MSNBC was on, all, it, it covered the spectrum. And um, I thought to myself, wow, I'm really glad I don't watch TV anymore. <laughs> I really hate it. I really, I think media has uh, so poisoned the, uh, the, any kind of discourse it's, it's ratcheted up the, the emotional element so that uh, when I would be watching any one of these, state, uh, these networks, I'd see like five minutes of news and then maybe 55 minutes of blather with a capital B. Uh, B and, and, uh, <laughs> and it was depressing and it, and it, and it uh, was just filling up space. And, and it made me so appreciate uh, the old Walter Cronkite days and Huntley Brinkley days where you had a half hour news. And somehow and it that's seemed to, the way it that is. seemed to comp encompass an awful lot. And, say, and if there was a crisis, yeah, they, they spend a few hours during the course of the day covering a particular event. But now, with this 24-7, um, it's made our jobs more difficult because things fall out, events. For, I mean, we had a bombing in New York uh, just last week while I was watching on the boat, you know? And, and, uh, and it's not, I, I, Steve didn't even talk to me about it, you know? He talked to me about what was going on in Charlotte. And, and Charlotte will be out of the news cycle as soon as another in, catastrophe in 15, happens. Oh, something else just happened, you see? That's right, see? 
So, uh, and Benghazi. And of course, there's always Benghazi. Anyway, so... We'll always have Benghazi. So for us, it's... <laughs> yes. For Did us, it's, it's made yeah. the, the job more difficult, I think. I would have just one last thing, yeah. too. Um, make no mistake about it, we have convictions. So we are not passively painting and drawing and making imagery. We are... I'm making Hillary look as stupid as possible. <laughs> like, I, I don't like Hillary, so I am enjoying the process, you know, of, of delighting in, in displaying her and vi making visual commentary. So whatever our convictions are, whatever we feel, we're always communicating, visually commenting on whatever our positions are. So I don't really know of anybody sort of passively sort no, of I'm making imagery. And I, nobody's saying that, but I just, right. it is, it is, a, it is a, it's an interesting thing. That I, we, I'm, an impassion, I'm an impassioned dystopian, so. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm cautiously pessimistic. Um, yes, go ahead. First of all, yes, I fell down in my own town. <laughs> That's, um, th I got a question on the reference material, uh, specifically uh, to Tom, but uh, all three of you. When you're grabbing the Getty images and you're reworking them, I mean, that's a great shorthand. But also, I mean, you can tell that a lot of your, I mean, like, okay, you found a great shot of Hillary or Donald or somebody that you used, and you could trace that back to, uh, say, the photo that you found online. And I'm thinking specifically of the, the Shepard Ferry case. Have you ever had any problems? Say, or do you have permission from Getty to reuse those images? Do you have, have has anything ever traced back to you, no pun intended, um, where you had a problem because of the original photographer? Uh, to, and it, this comes about the whole culture of reuse online. And um, I'm wondering if any of you have had any problems with that and what your thoughts are on that. I mean, I think it was a great shorthand. And you find that perfect picture of Hillary and you want to use it for a thing. Do you ever, have you had any problems? I've never had any problems. Uh, I do think about it, it's been discussed numerous times uh, with, between the art director and myself and whatever, but I've never, I've never had any issues with it. I'm, I, if you were to look at the photo that I'm taking, I usually find one awesome shot and it has great lighting on it, so I'm not messing around and trying to change things. But then I might have to have another image of, a sh of, of hair or whatever and then I, I you know, so however I can make that one image, but that face, I spend like a long time, I spend like an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, two hours to really find the face that is nailed, nails what I'm going for. And then I play in and I play it up and say change it up. But the initial, everything is essentially there. I guess if somebody, and, and the whole body is completely changed. So if they came up to me and found that face and came after me, maybe, but I don't We're think, talking I don't think anybody talking would have a case. The, the, Sh the Shepard Ferry thing was, was again, it was more the cover up than the, the, the actual away from the mic, that lifting of the image that, that sunk him. Sure. He, uh, Just separate. Uh, the image that he used Maybe was a very, you could find a lot of photographs where we were looking at Obama from the, from the chin up, in, uh, similar to that. But he did use a, a specific image. His problem was that he denied it, and then he tried to hide it, and then he tried to do all sorts of other stuff, and that just sunk him even more. Yeah, and I, I actually thought the case was BS, because, I mean, when you saw the photo next to the poster, he clearly had just used that as you know, a reference piece. Right. He and, didn't and, trace it, he and, didn't do anything and else. He and he morphed it into a, a comment of his own, you know? Um, so, yes, I agree, it was more or less a BS case. You know, after Roy Lichtenstein, I, I don't think there's going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be easy to make that case. Uh, once you repurpose something and put it into a new frame, into a new context, uh, it's changed. And, uh, uh, but, you know, Lichtenstein actually re-rendered precisely. These guys are caricaturists and, uh, once they get a hold of a piece of reference in their hands, it's, it's, it's altered. Once you've altered something, it's yours, right. I think. Anybody else? Yeah, my question is also about the reference material. And um, it's more about the, the process, the technique. You know, you're pulling from Getty and Google Images or whatever. You find that perfect photo and maybe it's, uh, you know, blue tinged or yellow tinged or something or, or you know, the, the light source is coming from the exact opposite side from maybe another 
uh, photo that you're pulling for another person in it. How do you work with uh, that if, if, if uh, it's not really uh, uh, fitting in with the whole of your piece? Uh, well, when the light sources are, are in conflict with each other, uh, that's where uh, all those years of studying drawing come in. And you're, you just, fl you know, just almost like uh, do a negative in your mind, and you're, you're throwing the shadows in the opposite direction. That's a technical trick. If you, if you look at their work, um, both these guys, they are showing you in their sketching how they are feeling the volumes of these objects. They're not just drawing shadows and lights. They are actually in their minds feeling and then feeling around with a, with a soft medium, a pencil or pastel or charcoal, how those volumes, that, that tactile experience is moving into 2D. And if you get into that, then what you're doing is you're pumping that into your photo reference. And it's, it's really this uh, alchemy that's taking place in your brain uh, that responds to years of training. Vic shows up at the Society of Illustrators on an average of once a month, maybe, to do their Tuesday night sketching. And if you're in New York, I urge you to drop around. It's lots of fun. The yeah, models Tuesday are always interesting. Yeah, Tuesday and Thursday nights we, at the Society, we have drawing sessions. And, and, and uh, it's right near the bar. Right near the bar. Which helps in the drawing a lot. So and, yeah, and Tuesday uh, night is naked, naked people. What is it, 15 bucks? Something like that, 15 years. All right, and you're, you're there all night with 70 people, and they're terrific. There's a lot of camaraderie and mass support. And, uh, and then uh, people like Victor show up, and you can see how poor you are as an artist. And, uh, no, but he's, no. But he's, you know, he's, we, we, he's drawing. He's actually, sometimes you're not drawing the model, you're drawing the other artists. Yeah. <laughs> but if you follow him on uh, Facebook, you'll see those pictures. Everybody should friend everybody here. Uh, as, and, and look at Vic's pictures from the society, and it shows what we're talking about. It's not, it's not that connected to photo reference. It's, it's, as I said, this alchemy that comes. And I teach illustration at School of Visual Arts, and I say, I'm not gonna grade you guys on talent. I don't care about talent. I say, I care about sweat. It's all about the sweat. And if you, and, and there's no problem that you're ever gonna have in illustration that you can't solve with extra sketching. And it all comes from that, and there's no shortcut. And it's not in the Google, I'm sorry, it's not in Google image. Okay. It's in that and this and this and memory, sense memory, like acting, you know? It, we're drawing from years of uh, information and, and practice and repetition. And, and angst and yeah. fear and, and, and uh, anguish. Speaking of anguish, here's Cal. <laughs> yeah, so thanks you guys for coming. This is really, really great. Really enjoy it. So um, actually, less of a question, more just a, a, a little story that I think you guys would particularly enjoy. Because you had mentioned about this notion of a new character coming onto the scene and how do you draw them? So there is this Irish cartoonist that many of you may have already met, Martin Turner, who had been to some of our conventions in the past. And he tells a story about a, an editorial illustrator just like you guys in Ireland. And it was before the internet, and he had been invited into the newspaper to draw a new politician who had just come onto the scene. So he goes, visits the editor, and the editor gives him the full lowdown of this character. And the, cartoon, the artist says, I'm ready, I'm ready, you know, just get me some photos, and I'm off. And, he, and the editor says, well, we don't have any pictures of the man himself, but we've got one of his brother. <laughs> and that was it. So I thought that was the best story I could get on getting. Did he did he draw did he draw the brother and then sort of imagine? I you know I I, I don't know the that rest of the story. I just you like know, leave remember, it hanging it like that. You remember a few years ago, Ralph Steadman said, "I'm not going to draw these guys anymore because it only encourages them." <laughs> yeah. So then he would just do politicians from the neck down. He would just draw them without heads, and then the head would be just, you know, yeah. Ralph's hit with the loaded brush. Um, you can get away with that. That'll work. Well, thanks, you guys, for coming. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you thank you. Hello. Hey. Thanks. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm so glad you guys are here. I love your commentary, and I've always thought there should be a Pulitzer category for your type of illustration. Um, my question is, do you ever get an assignment that reflects a point of view that is the opposite of yours? 
and yeah. it's just too juicy to turn down? Not, not any longer, uh, but there was a time uh, in the past before uh, people were wise to my game uh, that I get calls from conservative publications. Uh, but uh, after a while, you just say no so many times. Uh, I would feel really, really uncomfortable. You know, it goes against the whole ethos of what I'm supposed to be doing here. Right. I'm, I'm supposed to be using magazines and newspapers to get out my point of view. And if you have no point of view, then what are you? Right, right. Uh, and so I, I think that this whole thing, and a lot of illustrators, that I know don't agree with me or don't think about it ever. Uh, and I can name some names, I won't. Um, but uh, to me, that's, that's all this thing is. This is, this is about P POV. Yeah, you wanna go ahead, you wanna take that? Yeah, I, you know, I have convictions where I'll get a call and I just can't do that. You just, it's not, like Steve said, it's not who I am. And, and I don't care that even if it's juicy, like it just, it represents, it's well, me. It's a lot of money. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, it just, I can't do certain things and I've turned people down, magazines that just go against who I am. Are, are there some magazines that you flat out would not work for? That we flat out wouldn't work for? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, well, yeah. For, Unless for they me, called yeah. you with an article that you were okay with. You know? Except they wouldn't yeah. call you with an article. You'd be okay. <laughs> yeah, but but sometimes a magazine sometimes a magazine might be um, you might not agree with the magazine, but the the article, the, the story could be something juicy, but that isn't conflicting against maybe a conviction that you have. You see what I mean? So it's not that you're looking the other way, but sometimes there's a place for. Uh, that you're not slamming somebody that you might really care about. Like if, you know if, I mean? if a libertarian magazine called with a story about the military industrial complex, I could see myself doing that. But that's because there's a, a, uh, an overlap. Generally there isn't. Um, there, there was, uh, I'll give a case in point, just recent, The Village Voice. Uh, they were running a, 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 an issue on uh, the former pre police commissioner Bratton and uh, they kind of threw it to me to do all the illustrations to cover in the inside pieces as well. And it was, uh, there was an opportunity, it was based on this report that came out that said, well, since 2011, there's been no, uh, this, this um, broken windows policy isn't, you know, has made no impact. And uh, I read the story, what, I, what they presented me with, and then I kind of like looked online and was reading more about the, the, the commission itself that was, um, that had, had done the study. And I came up with a great idea uh, because I like Bratton. I, I've met him, he's, he's, I think he's an incredible le leader, ha had been an incredible leader for the NYPD. And um, I, uh, uh, I said, you know, guys, yeah, since 2011, just letting you know where I stand. I'll, I'm going to do a concept, but I'm not going to trash Br Bratton. So I, I took the broken windows policy, and, in, and, and, and uh, rather than make Bratton look bad so much, I, I, it was more like the emperor, they wanted the emperor had no clothes. Well, I said, what if the, the emperor was wearing a glass uniform and it kind of like was shattered, and then it's, uh, it's, it's scattered all over the floor, and we've gotten just exposed enough. But uh, I didn't want it to be, I really didn't want it to be insulting, and I still think I, I came off with a very solid piece uh, for the cover. The inside piece was great because I, uh, I parodied Norman Rockwell's The Runaway, and I had uh, a huge uh, NYPD officer sitting next to a very diminutive uh, Mayor de Blasio with, with Br uh, Br uh, Commissioner Bratton behind the, the counter where the, uh, if, uh, in that uh, in that iconic image, in which and if you did if you weren't aware of the Norman Rockwell painting that Vic was referencing, his illustration was so good it didn't matter. It was just a, well, it's it was, the, it's it was a the, cycle of pieces that, it's in the permanent that were collection all A one. Congratulations! It's in the permanent collection now at the Rockwell. They say, well, this yeah, is pretty fair. The Rockwell funny. Museum wanted that piece. Awesome. Yeah. I'm going to ask another one. <laughs> Could you all name a couple of contemporary illustrators whose work you admire? Who isn't on this stage? Who isn't on the stage? Yeah. Well, there's you. <laughs> um, Ralph Steadman. 
These are living people, right? Ralph Steadman. Can, when you're talking contemporary, you mean like current or, tra or traditional? Okay. I love Ralph. I love Ed Sorrell. Um, I'm, I'm a tremendous fan of Brian Stauffer. Anybody who doesn't know that name, write it down. S-T-A-U-F-F-E-R. One of the most brilliant uh, 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 image makers in America. Edel Rodriguez, another strong political artist. He did the melting Trump face for the cover of Newsweek. Uh, and uh, I, I could name a whole lot of Suko, Francis Jetter, Marshall Arisman, Brad Holland, good conservative. Who is? Say again? <laughs> Anita Kuntz, yes, we love Anita. Uh, Barry Blit, um, and present company. Yeah, I mean. And the cast of thousands. Th these guys, I love their work. And um, I. I I mean, I love, uh, I, I, I think more image-wise now than I do just draftsmanship and just somebody with great drawing. Um, but uh, Bill Mayer is uh, uh, one of the, I think, one of the greatest image makers, I think, of our time. Uh, he's a, a M-A-Y-E-R, Bill Mayer. Uh, the guy is just a genius, and uh, he's a very humble guy, but uh, he's a great image maker. I, 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 I've, do a, I've done a, a talk with showing image making, and he's one I talk about. There's another guy, uh, Pascal. He's a technical master. Yeah, he's, he, everything and, and, and he does. Do you, do you know how big those things are, no. the little gouache things? He's a brilliant, he's genius. So, uh, and another guy, Pascal Campion, who's uh, uh, become a friend of mine. Uh, he's, uh, he, he, he draws um, for, um, um, in, in Hollywood for uh, um, movies. And a lot of the guys I really love now are probably more working for these studios and their, their draftsmanship is amazing. So, but Pascal Campion is another really uh, great image maker. So. Yeah, my, my, my influences were uh, and still remain people uh, uh, repeating what uh, Steve said here. Um, uh, Ed Sorrell, who I really felt that there, was, there should have been a school, you know, like certain uh, like Rembrandt had a school of, uh, of artists very much in that tradition. And I, uh, early on in my career, I, uh, I, I really uh, gravitated toward what Ed was doing because that was the way, it reflected the way I drew. I, I kind of like find myself f searching for the, the, the line, for the form, for the, for the volume, uh, and also going for the gag. Uh, Rick Meyerowitz, uh, not brought up. Uh, Rick Meyerowitz was a huge influence. Uh, Rick Meyerowitz was one of those uh, epiphanies for me as a uh, as an art student. And his Mona, when his Mona Gorilla hit the National Lampoon cover, it was like, oh, this is this is what I want to do. I want to really do something very funny and 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 absurd, you know. And so uh, that was that was one. Uh, uh, one more person, uh, Stedman, of course. Stedman's like God, you know. Stedman, uh, Tommy Unger. Uh, Tommy is brilliant. Contemporary, uh, I'm, just about everybody that uh, that Steve's mentioned too. There are so many people, and of course now it's like a you know. This is why I'm bad at. I don't want to ever go back to school because I'm bad when when confronted with a question that I got to answer right right up. Because there's so many names that are now blanking out on me. But uh, I look. You know, I'm going, oh, great, 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 you know. Can I tell you a really, really fast Sorrell story? Um, one week, the uh, New York Times did a story about Vic and showed his uh, uh, embed drawings and a series of his wounded warrior drawings, and uh, which are one of a kind, uh, very unique uh, and powerful. And it was like a... Was it a full page or a half page? A full page. It was a full page in uh, the review, I think the review section? Uh, the the, the uh, Sunday Times uh, so, yeah. uh, Arts and Leisure. Art and Leisure, okay. It was a beautiful page. The next day, I'm at Whole Foods on Columbus Avenue, and I bump into Ed Sorrell. And, uh, and we're talking about Victor's page. And, uh, he says, yeah, that's really good work, but of course, you know, he, he says to me, he says, yeah, he did them from photographs, of course. And I said, no, no, Vic went there. He, he went in with the troops. He went to the zone, and uh, he drew on the spot. And Sorrell 
smiled and he said, well, maybe I should be imitating him. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that's a great coda to that whole thing. Good. You, we all start out being influenced by somebody. And I, can t I could uh, give you some names um, uh, of people who start off feeling uh, very influenced by other artists. And then it inevitably happens, and this is very important, I'm encouraging students to be influenced by people. It inevitably happens that your own individuality kicks in. And it may take time. It may take, but, but you are so much better for having learned what you did along the way. Um, I think we need to be a little self, less self-conscious and more like children and just like, just draw. Shut up and draw right, right. And, and allow the thing to happen and, uh, and just trust, as my friend from Chile says, trust in the life. Nick. Thank you. Uh, Tom, I think you've done a few ayatollahs for Weekly Standard, right? Yeah. Uh, and they look m very well, like it seems that you followed their rhetoric or what they've mm -hmm. been saying for years, but without, I, I guess, without knowing Persian. And that's very interesting for me because when you draw, let's say, Trump or Hillary, mm -hmm. you've known them through the media, you've right. watched them. And that was tremendous for me to see how you portray like Rouhani or Khamenei so well. How did you get to their souls or how did you just extract it? Well, I'm not really sure I get to their souls. I think uh, perception is reality. So if you notice something that moves you that maybe I'm doing, uh, you're seeing things that maybe I'm not aware of. And so, um, you know, we don't really have a lot of time to spend on any image we make uh, most of the time. And so we are gathering th this information in front of us and we're looking and we're studying and we're, we're going back and forth trying to get a read on who this person is. We may read a little bit and you know, we're trying to build our information to help us accurately represent and draw something. So, um, I mean, how, how do we do it? I just think um, it's just a matter of, uh, like I said, doing some legwork and really studying and looking and, 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 and maybe even just sketching for a while till you get a really good feel for something. Um, most, and yeah, reading. I mean, if you draw something, usually by the, I, I, I teach online and I say, draw something a hundred times. When you get to the hundredth drawing, then you're really probably getting it and understanding it. Um, so I don't know if that really answers it, but um, that's, what, that's, how it, that's how it works. We were discussing something like this over dinner last night where caricaturing is not, it's not really easy. If you're really trying to get to, a per, uh, to the personality, if you're really trying to flesh out a personality in, in a character, there are, uh, there are incredible technicians out there. All you gotta do is go to Facebook or uh, go into the web, and there are people who could, except Tom, they could, couldn't draw him, draw him or paint him under a table, but uh, they could draw me under a table in no time. But they don't <coughs> invest a, a point of view. In, right. in, the, in their caricatures. They're brilliant, brilliant technicians. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's what's, uh, I think that's, the, that, that's that uh, separation. I'm gonna what, say a radical thing. Read newspapers. <laughs> Read yeah. newspapers. <laughs> newspapers are the excellent delivery system for news. It beats everything. Even as they're getting beaten up. And if you wanna, if you wanna, has anybody read the Jack Schaefer piece uh, on, I think it was on Slate, about the virtue, please Google this and read it. It's one of the most magnificent things I've read in a long time. And he really nails why newspapers must survive. Because that's the only way to truly be well informed, is to read newspapers. So, at the risk of sounding like a fuddy-duddy, Okay, I can be a Thank fuddy you. and a daddy. Yes, yeah, Steve, David Horsey from the LA Times. Hey. Um, and I, I, Thank you I, for I, letting me borrow your page once in a while. Yeah, well, that's actually the one thing I want that's to That's why he's on. here. You son of a bitch. Yeah, he's here. Of a bitch. <laughs> no, actually, you made me feel worse today because whenever you're in the LA Times, I think, God, that's brilliant. But, you know, he's got weeks to do that. Now, from what you've said, you actually draw faster than I do. So I don't know why they don't just hire you. But 
I'm not don't, gonna, it's okay for this to be a mutual I, admiration I'm society, not but we don't do that. each other's thing. Yeah, and it's but like, actually, there was a point you made that, uh, uh, that you just touched on briefly that uh, reflected something we talked about in a panel yesterday, this idea about Trump um, as sort of this unique individual who seems in some ways impervious. You, know, you can do the, the best caricature or most outrageous or most you know, damning thing, but somehow it, it almost builds him up more than yeah, it does. Yeah, he's like a fire eater. Yeah. Where you just shovel coals and he, he gobbles them up and gets, <laughs> yeah, no. and gets more fire. Yeah. So I just wanted you to talk about, what's, what's that all about? What, what, what is it? I mean, I can, I can think of some things, but... I don't know. really, I don't entirely understand it, uh, except uh, I was talking to Ben a few minutes oh, ago God, about this, that, uh, an article somebody wrote uh, saying that Trump's flaws and his faults and corruptions, lies, uh, slipperiness, uh, hypocrisy, do not fall into the uh, category of political figures. So it outrages us who follow political figures uh, deeply. But they do, those flaws do fall into the category, a different category which we accept, which is the category of the robber baron. These are the flaws of a Carnegie, of a Rockefeller, of a Jack Welch, a buccaneering, risk-taking, heroic, greedy, money-grubbing American hero. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at him that way, and I think a lot of Americans excuse all these flaws in that kind of a guy. But right? why, but why? This is going back to the media reality television. People have grown up with C Trump now, but they've also grown up with all these reality shows uh, where they watch people plot against each other. The winners are always the scummiest human beings uh -huh. on the planet. Thank you. And everybody roots for them, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what, this, this uh, more than any campaign I can think of, this campaign is a reality. It's a goddamn reality show where the, ra the rattiest bastards make it to the top mm -hmm. and, and, uh, 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 and everybody, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if so-and-so on, uh, on, on Real Housewives or, or whatever it is where they eliminate, <laughs> or whatever they There's eliminate each idea. other, the uh, what they say, everybody's going, yeah, but that, that's, that's fine, that's fun, that's great fun. So you, we can say whatever we want about Trump. That's like, um, that feeds into right. what, they've, what everybody's been accustomed to. Yeah, that also, makes, you part that, of the, makes you part of the reality show. Absolutely, and also he's been on that show. People have gotten conditioned to seeing him as this executive. He sits at the day and he's firing people, you know? Right. And I've heard, I, as God is my witness, I've heard, this is what we need. Somebody come into Washington, just go down the hallways and fire people. And that's how it works. How do we not realize that that's how Washington works? You know, you just go down the hallway and you say, you're out, you're out, you're out, you're out, you're out. Yeah, yeah. You know, no, and this is, a, uh, this is the, a further dumbing down of the populace. Yeah, agreed. I agree. So we are, we, are, we are criticizing somebody as if they were playing game A and they're actually playing game B and we don't really make the shift. We don't really go to game B because we don't, as cartoonists, as journalists, as you know, puff piece opinion writers, never did that. We never had a creature like this before. Maybe we'll figure it out before November 8th, but for now, he has a game and he's winning this game uh, on his terms, which is very possibly to lose this election by not too much and then take all his supporters who will now lay down their lives for him and have them buy more stuff. Does that make sense? I think originally he wanted to lose, but just to have a, get that uh, media attention enough to just keep his, uh, his, his name brand you know, healthy. It, and it got out of control. It actually became a viable candidate. You know. What do you What are you feeling about this? Do you do, yeah. Have you had the experience of just throwing the kitchen sink at this and then having oh, yeah. I mean, like I've been a feeling that you just but I, I think actually shouting into exactly the exactly what you're saying is because I mean Hillary Clinton's fault, fault flaws are very they're conventional political. She is a political. We know that kind pal. of person. Yeah. 
And, and, and I think you're exactly right. The, 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 the public also sees her in this box, whereas Trump has created his own box. He's in this new box, this, this, this mix of the media and entertainment and myth. And so, yeah, so it it's really kind of doesn't matter how you draw him. It's just It's like he's Andy Kaufman, you know? This is right. like performance right. art. That's true. Yeah. You're good. That's Andy Kaufman. Kaufman. Right? It's like Andy Kaufman running for president. Yeah. It's right. like I do this, I do this, I do this. You get upset. Yeah. Thank you so very much. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's good. I better let somebody else on here. Um, Thanks. I just want to say real quick, um, the, in a, at 12.15, uh, the bus, if anybody is going back to the hotel, <laughs> missing the um, you know, <laughs> we, will, we will encourage like one or two more questions, but some of you that may need the bus, we have a box lunch outside and we'll have time, <laughs> but um, you, know, you can take one or two more questions. Anyone that needs to go back to the hotel, start um, getting ready to go back, but um, we still have a few minutes. All right. Thanks. If we miss the entire bus, can we just find an Uber somewhere? Isn't it, isn't it like that? It's totally. It's like, I, I don't it's care. Totally, it's totally. I say this, I say this. Sir, yeah, you don't totally. like it? Uh, Great. It's totally. I, I would I'm like sorry. to just uh, follow up a bit on uh, really continue the conversation you were having. It, uh, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, politics was this uh, serious issues discussed by serious, boring people. And it was the I'm job of the, the cartoonists and the illustrators to add a little levity and fun to the thing, but now that the entire process seems to be turning into levity and fun, uh, can the cartoonist actually switch to, in effect, make the message, look, there's actually something serious about this, and I is it possible for cartoonists to tell people that things are more serious than we're, they appear? We're finally getting to the most important question you know, of the yes, whole thing, uh, and I have, I would love you guys to talk, I, I, I mean, would, I'll try it. Uh, my feeling is that irony isn't dead, it just switched sides, <laughs> you know. And, uh, Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you guys have a response to that? A short answer, no. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, short answer, no to the question. Uh, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know what impact we make, you know? Raise I think, your hand if you're... Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, again, going back to that dystopian point of view, um, I, I, I think that whatever we do is appealing... First appeals to the people that already are on the, in the same choir. Uh, if I do some for Rolling Stone, somebody who reads National Review is not necessarily going to A, read the publication to begin with, B, give, give a shit what I drew, you know, so, uh, and, and vice versa, you know. Um, can I ask for a show of hands uh, if you as a cartoonist have uh, recognized this point and have changed your tactic in any way to um, adapt to some kind of new sensibility this year? One, two, three, okay. So uh, s some people have and uh, I... Uh, the idea is sort of like uh, recognizing that uh, instead of us being the, the parodist and the clown, that we actually see the clown taking over elsewhere and that maybe our job is to bring, use our tools as communicators to introduce some <laughs> information <laughs> into the uh, experience of, of, of journalism. Um, I really like the idea of infographics. Uh, I like the idea of uh, uh, like my GQ series on, on the illustrated quotes. I didn't change any of the words. A lot of those Village Voice convention pieces where I didn't change any of the quotes, I just illustrate them. Uh, to drive home a real thing. And not to make somebody into something else, but just to say, um, you know, by doing a drawing, you can underline an idea or a, re a reality. It's an absolutely true thing that we're spending an entire campaign without discussing the top five issues that are facing America. And those top issues are not somebody's emails, and it's not somebody's hair. And uh, to me, they're climate change, inequality, racism, gun, vi gun violence, uh, and a, a, uh, an electoral system that's destroyed by money, uh, and, uh, and also gerrymandering. And I, and I think the, that the, and, and the nullification Congress, uh, I haven't heard that term very much, but it's six, six years of the Republican Party stopping the United States government from functioning. Why doesn't anybody want to talk about this? 
Uh, we are stuck on crap and garbage. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and I'm waiting for the debate. Maybe Hillary might mention one of these issues uh, and, uh, and look for some actual discussion of policy. Uh, but we're very driven by clicks and ratings. Um, and that's, our, that's one of our big problems. David? Thank you for a wonderful presentation. I enjoyed it very much. In a related vein, do you ever find yourselves becoming too shrill as a result of your personal convictions or, or uh, because you uh, are alarmed increasingly about what could happen in November? And if so, do you find that you have to uh, constrain yourself to be more persuasive or constrain yourself for aesthetic reasons? Too shrill? I've never had a governor, really. No such thing. You're never too shrill. No, I don't think so. I mean, you have a, every magazine has a uh, temperament, yeah. you know? Right. And so you, you can't, if you're drawing for, like, you don't, you don't draw the same way for everyone because everybody has a certain reader temperament. So you, you know if a magazine's calling you what's permissible and how far to go. Just like Der Spiegel told me it was too crazy. It was, it was too weird of a bush. So, you know, like in terms of how shrill, um, I, I think you, you start learning your magazines that you're working for and you know their temperament, and you know how to draw. So your client, Basically, they're calling you to do what you do, so. So your client constraints then restrain you. You're professional enough to recognize the audience and to adapt for that. Yeah, I mean, that, at least that's my, my POV. I've never thought of any successful caricature, no matter how far out, as shrill. Shrill has, a, has a, a connotation of something that is uh, inarticulate, uh, loud to the point of, of, of um, not expressing itself well. I think a shrill caricature is a poor caricature. Mm -hmm. um, the most extreme caricaturists in the world, Daumier, Goya, David Levine, George Gross, they're never shrill. They're kick-ass. <laughs> and, I, and, and I don't think you can be kick-ass enough. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh, hey guys. Hi. Um, first of all, just really, all three of you, just wonderful, Thank you. wonderful work. Thank you. I have a question for Tom, though, specifically. Yeah. Um, some of the images you put up there, you're like, oh, this is digital. I did it in a day. I did it when I was sitting on the can or whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, you just knock it out. Um, you must be taking a lot of time in the pencil stage, solving problems, choosing color palettes, all of those kinds of things. Um, how much time are you putting into, let's say, the pencil uh, concept stage before you go to the final art on the digital piece? Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really, I know have people work in different ways. I have a friend that will submit five ideas, six ideas. I, I get briefed. I know about what they want. Uh, sometimes there's a sketch for me, but sometimes not. And um, I just... Uh, I have a good sense because I've been doing this for 20 years uh, now, and so I really have a gut feeling that this is right on. And in, so I don't present five different ideas because I can't believe in either, of, uh, none of them. I believe in one, and when I submit it, it's, it's based off of the collaboration and the brief that it's really going to work. Um, then there's tweaks and changes, but um, I'm not doing um, color studies. This is, you know, Rockwell had like four weeks on an image and he'd, he'd mail his... Months. Right. Yeah, I'm talking, you know, it was crazy. This is a digital age, so they're calling on Tuesday or Wednesday. I got a, I got a call on Thursday morning, the cover's due at six. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know... Really? Same day? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's nothing. Really? Like, that's it, normal. It but, looks like you spent a week or so on it. Mean, um, just beautiful. Thank very, you. Very involved. No, um, I, I, I wish I had more time. I'm not trying to make oh, yeah. myself sound like a genius, like I did this in a day. But that's the way, Nate, that's the way editorial is. Yeah. And so... Um, it's I, also the way to get a magazine addicted to you. If you're that good, they feel, that, oh, we can call him in the morning and he'll get it out. And that, you know, if you're involved with a weekly publication, yeah, it that's just, a relationship. Yeah, it just happened this week. The Weekly Standard called me on Tuesday maybe Wednesday and I had to crank it out Wednesday night down into Thursday morning and then I came on the plane but I'm just simply saying that the deadlines are crazy 
but it's what we love to do, so we, we make time for it. But in terms of all this prep work, yeah. I'm not drinking coffee, just sort of like looking at it and you know backing off. And I mean, I'm cranking, I'm moving, and oh, everything yeah. drops. I can't go pick up my daughter from work. I'm 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 there. Yeah, you know? focused and involved. And yeah. One of my best professors always said, uh, "Artwork's never finished; it's only abandoned." Yeah. Because <laughs> you just run out of time, or they run out of money to keep working. Yeah. On right. Like right. That. So yeah. I, I never know when I'm really done. It's just kind of like, okay, I got to get it done and finish it, and there's a deadline. So I would add in two. I think what and Steve kind of mentioned this. It's not so much about Google and Getty. It's really about the essence of the piece. There's an overall essence that happens and that's communicated when we create something that it hits you. It doesn't matter if it's suggestive, meaning quicker, or photographic and tightly rendered. It has to have a life to it and an essence, an overall powerhouse, kick-ass piece. It has, to, it has to communicate like emotion. And that's what's more important than technicality. Mm -hmm. Technicality sucks. I know I could point to 10 different artists that just their work, I'm bored with it. It just doesn't do anything. But these guys, I see their work and it moves me. Like I'm moved when I see their work. So there's something beyond technicality, beyond preparation. And it's, it's really a matter of, of just raw skill, rapidly firing, going crashing into a deadline. It's a, it's a combination of the brain, the eye, and the heart. Yes, You can put all those engaged, things together. Sure. Some people just have the, the eye. So Cezanne said that about Monet. He said, uh, he's only an eye, but what an eye. <laughs> so if you. if you don't yeah. mind, we'll have uh, just time for one more question to give people a chance to have lunch. Sure, uh, sure. Have, uh, uh, given the state of print these days, uh, do you find your client list growing, shrinking, or staying about the same? Client list for me is, uh, uh, it's, it's like a, uh, a, a bathtub uh, where the water is pouring in and pouring out at the same time and you can take a bath if you're judicious uh, about it um, but uh, we're losing magazines, we're losing uh, ad space, we're losing illustrations, a lot of magazines are still in, in uh, business and they don't use illustrations anymore. Uh, people they used to work with just don't use illustrations. How could you have a magazine without illustrations? Sports S Illustrated was called Sports Illustrated. Once it had a ton Curry. of illustrations Curry. in it. And look at a Sports Illustrated the past, I don't know, 10 Bloomberg, years. Bloomberg uh, News, Bloomberg Magazine, oh, yeah. right? Uh, no illustrations no. in it. Business Week. Um, hmm. So, uh, but on the other hand, uh, Peter Barbie buys Village Voice, turns out he's a big fan of what we do. Uh, that opens up. Uh, Wynn McCormick just bought New Republic. He's a big fan of what we do. That opens up. Uh, the nation has a terrific new art director named Robert Best, big fan of what we do. So uh, it's, uh, it's like Grand Hotel, people come, people go, nothing ever happens. But in this case, a lot happens. But you stay functional as an illustrator if you are aware of all these people, all these machinations. There's no, oh, there's no more Gawker? All right, let's we take care of that. Then suddenly BuzzFeed is coming up and the ProPublica is buying illustration, all this stuff. You're just processing all the time, which means it's okay to be an illustrator as long as you never get to bed. I was, that, I'm glad he said that because really uh, we need to be two, at least two, three people uh, keeping yourself active in the social media Keeping, that used to be a job of an agent, and once upon a time, uh, I'm, I'm spoiled. I, I, for the first almost four decades, uh, people were calling me, and uh, I'm not a pitcher like, like Steve is. It's not, it's not my personality, so uh, I'm kind of screwed. You're a power hitter. Hmm? You back clean up. I back clean up. I okay, think it's also you. diversification. Like, you, you, I'm not just sitting around waiting for magazines to call. I'm, I'm, it's one part of what I do, but I, I'm always thinking outside the box about, it's almost like Microsoft. Where do you want to go today? Where do you want to go tomorrow? Where do you want to be? What do you want to do? Bye. So I, 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 I paint and do different things. Editorial is one area. So you, you have to think outside the box. There are a lot of markets out there. Yeah. As a student of mine said, fire in all directions. So as, as things diminish, other things expand. Yep. And, uh, and just be available to those new, new things and, and adapt, and I think we're going to be fine. Just uh, I'm, I worry all the time, and that's good. It's, a good. it's a good note to end on. We're going to be fine. And everybody give a, a big round of applause for these guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.